and we are live uh, on Facebook too. So, good hello, morning, people. If good you're morning, watching us morning. on YouTube, uh, good morning. Today is uh, Friday in Bali. Maybe still Thursday in North America. Isn't it is it? Thursday evening. We are always a step ahead down here. We are always a step ahead. <laughs> we are well ahead of everybody. And there you go, Steve. Uh, first comment out there. Good morning, Steve. Good to see you. Is that Steve Wright? Yes. Who Good has this over there, Wright. guys? If you're joining us uh, live uh, on Facebook or YouTube, uh, come and write a comment. Uh, say hi. Good morning. Hello, everybody out there. Say hello. Yes. It is morning. We I've need got coffee. Yes, I got nothing because we ran out of water. We did. And then uh, it's morning, guys, so we need your help. We really need your help down in the comments. Uh, see who's awake. Yes. There we go. Hello, Andy. Good to see you. Another comment coming in. Let me share it on my page. That will help. If I awesome. can get there. Do, 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 do. And then uh, today, Mike, who are we going to have on the show? We have got Mr. Uh, oh, no, they can't see it. They, they're looking at us. No, no, we no. have got Marty Snyderman on the show. Yes. Marty is a legendary uh, photographer. Mainly these days, he's a photographer. Um, but he's also, many people may not know, that uh, a very accomplished cinematographer as well. Worked on a lot of television shows back in the day, like uh, Wild Kingdom. i uh, been involved with the Howard Hall, BBC, all these kind of things. Did a lot of the cinematography. And now he's he's specializing in underwater mm -hmm. photography. He, he's he been with all the, group. all the different magazines. Yeah, he's mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of the main contributors for a lot of different magazines. And what's interesting now, what we'll find out when we talk to Marty as well, is that he's now uh, teaching uh, online. underwater photography online. So, so here is your opportunity exactly. to get some online tuition in underwater photography with uh, one of the most experienced a living legend and the water photographer out there and then good morning paul good morning anna pepe steve uh, babette pepe, wake good early to see you yes uh, we're building up a crowd also for today's show that's very very good to see right so we are at the end of this week are yeah. we going to be on again next week we will be we will be monday wednesday and friday as per normal even though a lot of places in the world are actually opening up and people are getting back to doing what they're doing. We're uh, still a little slow here yes. in Bali. So we are still locked in we're, this we're, room. We're, 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 <laughs> we're not leaving Sonora yet. No. So we'll be here Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Uh, uh, uh. Monday, what are we doing? We're doing a 5 p.m. Monday, a 5 p.m. Wednesday and an 8 a.m. Friday. And who are we going to have on Monday? Monday, we've got Helen Sampson. Helen yeah. is uh, a producer working for all those different... Uh, companies in Bristol in the natural history world. So she's got some very cool insight about what it takes to to create a, uh, a natural history uh, production. Mm -hmm. And also a very interesting story about yeah. how, how she, she started into. and how she got into it uh, via the conservation world. And then on Wednesday, we're going to have uh, Kay Byrne Lim. Another cinematographer. Kay is... Uh, based in Perth, he's stuck in Perth at the moment, as he says. Uh, mm -hmm. He's been working on a lot of big productions recently. Yeah. Uh, great whites. He's got some great stories that he's going to tell us. So he, he goes through a bunch of different images and tells us the story behind the uh, the video and the images and the production. So again, very good insight into how um, working on natural history and, and wildlife filmmaking. Yes. And also another very interesting story behind uh, how yeah, he, how got, he got, got there. Into. Exactly. Yes. There's hope yet, people. There is hope. It's actually, it's a it sounds like sometimes by chance, but uh, you or by luck. But you need to actually try work. your luck. Yeah, you yeah, need to you work. You need to it. work your luck, and then these uh, things is they're gonna happen. But we will see more uh, during those episodes. And Friday, who are we gonna have? Friday, we have Richard Pyle and Brian Green back into our back into our rebreather uh, crowd that we've been working on. Yeah, these guys are ichthyologists, fish scientists that regularly work down 400, 500 feet, uh, over 100 meters mm -hmm. on their rebreathers. Filming. Uh, filming. Catching fish. Collecting fish, talking on helium. They've got <laughs> some fantastic stories yeah. uh, that they'll tell. You may you may need uh, some parental guidance required on that one yeah, uh, uh, with some of the helium talk. I don't know if the, the, the Mickey with, Mouse. With the helium voice, Mickey Mouse, we don't need parental. <laughs> we don't need parental guidance. <laughs> Just don't bring your children to the show. Exactly. It's a really good show as well. So very yeah. good stories that they have to tell about uh, trips down to the deep and finding some interesting fish. Yeah, very entertainment. And they, they gave us the, some very interesting videos yes, to, to sure. look at. Uh, 
Very, very nice. So another very exciting week uh, coming up ahead. Yes. Time. And continuing with the shows. Exactly. So it's, uh, it, and then after we got another full week after that. So we have got shows coming at you all the way through until July. Until July. Very, very exciting. Yes. So and even though you guys may be going out and getting back into your normal lives, you still should set away a, a, an hour or two every day for uh, every three days. Every second day. Yes. For the Underwater Tribe. For the Underwater Tribe. Don't miss that because they're not going to last forever. We've no. been actually talking this morning. Like we need to actually we think need to about. We get out of the office. We need to get uh, some strategy here because with all this lockdown continuing to stay, we need to figure it out a way <laughs> to stay here. <laughs> How do we get out of the office? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. And uh, well, so I would say that uh, being morning and still like a coffee away. Yep. It's time to go straight it's into, time to go the, into Marty. Into the interview with Marty Steiner. Marty is here. Where he is has Marty? joined us. He's joined us in the chat here, guys. So if Marty, you are, say hi. Say hi in the are, chat. If you are, if you guys have any questions while we're talking, while Marty's mm. talking, any comments, throw them there in the chat, and Marty should uh, be able to answer your questions. All right. Why I didn't see him over here? Oh, I need to oh, scroll down. Scroll there down. I He's see. There. We also got the Christy, Marty. Michelle is there as well. Miko is there. Yup. Yes. Yup. Live from Australia. Yeah. Michelle from California. Hello, Michelle. How are you? And here we go with the interview with Marty Snyderman. Interview and uh, actually the great presentation that really he nice gave us. Here we go. Hang on a second. We have a volume issue here. It's not uh, working in. Let me figure uh -oh. it out why. Mike, it's uh -oh. your time to shine. You are on camera. Uh -oh. Let's go and entertain. Ah, Michelle. Uh, hi. So Michelle is in the comments there as well. So what's the issue we've got? Don't worry about that. So just uh, uh -oh. bring up some entertainment. All right. So <laughs> it's interesting about what Marty's doing with us here is he's actually put together a good presentation where he will walk us through these different photos. So it's a good history of what uh, his uh, his career as well as what he's up to now. So yes. And I think here we've we got are our sorted. Yeah, we, we, sorted? Got it. we got it sorted. All right. Here we go. Take two. And today, very happy to have on the show Mr. Marty Snyderman. How are you, Marty? I, I'm doing great, and I'm I'm really tickled to do this. I, you know, nobody likes the pandemic, but I really love being connected to the ocean community. So thanks for having me. This is this is fun. We're fun. really excited to have you. Actually. Very excited. Hi, Marty. Luca. We're uh, for for the, there'll probably be a few people out there that that maybe don't know of your breadth of work, how long you've been. In, in the industry and stuff like that. You've got you've prepared a, a great slideshow of images for us here. But one of the things I want to talk about is just a little bit of how you got into it. Because I know we've had already a couple people on the show who have mentioned Chuck Nicklin. And I know that you also got your start with it. It seems to have been a bit of a a bit of a hotbed of uh, of starting people in the filming and, and the diving industry are still in it today. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how you got into it? You know, I, I, I can, and I, what, it, it's interesting, Mike, because people would ask me often today, how, you know, how can I follow in your footsteps or the footsteps of your peers? And I can tell you what I did. I don't know what to tell somebody today. The diving world was so different, but I worked on a sailboat, um, for Windjammer Cruises in the Caribbean. And we were phenomenally dangerous. We got people hurt all the time. <laughs> I, I went down there, I got my job. I had, I had $17 in my pocket, landed a job making $3.33 a day, worked my way up to the ship's diver. I made $9.99 and I got tips. <laughs> and then started to realize I, I became fourth in command of this boat. It was just crazy. And I didn't want to hurt somebody. I didn't want to be around it. So I came back to the States and all my luggage got lost. Everything I owned got lost, oh, no. but I ended up making my way to the West coast to go to a diving instructors college. NASDS was a certification agency in those days. And I went and somehow I had, when I graduated, 
in, Jan in uh, March of 1975, I had made 27 scuba dives in my life, graduated first in my class as a diving instructor. And the way you could tell I was a diving instructor, the only way would have been, I would have had a patch on my jacket. I, I had no other qualifications. I mean, it was, I, I really did apply myself at the college and I knew this was something I wanted to do. I had been to college. Right. Most of the guys I was in, in this diving instructor's college with had not. We were literally right across the street from a strip joint. <laughs> and they went, I, I was scared. I'd borrowed five, $5,000 from my father to do this with the agreement that there was not ever another penny coming until this money got paid back. Fair enough, the rules were set. And I studied, I did this, I applied myself. And, but in, in terms of water skills, I was completely underqualified when I graduated. And I went for an interview. I had heard about Chuck Nicklin's diving locker in San Diego. The college was in San Diego. And that was where I wanted to go. It's the reason I went to the college there, but I hadn't gone to the store and said, hey, I'm going to this thing because I'd like to go to work for you. But I, I went over there for an interview and I was the it's because of the politics of the industry in those days, they kind of thought they were getting sent the dregs because their competitor ran the college. Right. And so they said to me, how many people can you teach? And in those days, instructors often taught 20 or 20 plus people in a class. Oh, wow. wow. And yeah. in California visibility, that just scared me to no end, you know, wow. and, uh, so I said, ah, oh, six, four, two, maybe one, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and they said they'd never had anybody say that before. So I got hired wow. and a guy named Lou Feed hired me. Lou, the, Lou got, had a lot of um, street credibility in the instructional community internationally. And so this little relatively small dive shop, I mean, Southern California was certainly a diving hub, but you know, we were a we were a little shop on the corner, had three, two satellite stores and, um, and I got hired, but there was six people that were there at that time, went on to receive, you know, what Nogi awards are? Yep. Well, Chuck and his son Flip and Howard, and I introduced Michelle to Howard. I put Michelle Hall in Howard's class. It was one of the first things I did when I was working there. <laughs> and, uh, and then Good Lou Fee. Lou Feed, and then I, I was honored at, uh, in, I think, 20, uh, 2018. But so, so the point being, if there were 30 employees or 25 employees, uh, more than just a handful went on to have lifelong careers in the diving industry. And at that time, Chuck was filming uh, Hollywood movies, underwater movies, the, the Deep and the Abyss. And he had a bunch of Hollywooders coming through the shop at times. And and, uh, you know, it was a great place to work. He, and Chuck like, was extremely good to us for a long time. Sounds uh, like a very good place to start. Uh, yeah. And I, I glommed on. I had nothing to offer but enthusiasm. It works. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I slept the tanks. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you went at basically, you went on from there. Um, and I, you got most, I'm going to say, most of your early work, I guess, was more. Um, I guess really a combination of between photography and video for a long time. You were, you were more of a video guy. Recently you've gotten more back into the photography side of it, more specialized in photography, but you've, like I said, you've, you've got a, a, a slideshow that you've sent us here that I believe you will sort of progress your way through the story of your, of your career. I, I hope, I hope so. I hope that's interesting. One thing I should say to preface this is when I started at the diving locker, I, I was, you know, this patch on your jacket instructor, but I didn't know anything about how the diving locker did things. So I had to take a class that one of their instructors taught, you know, and audit that class. Well, yep. the instructor was Howard Hall. Okay. So Howard and I became fast friends and, and went diving after class, you know, and whatever. And he took me on my first night dive. One night he said, after a pool session, you want to go make a night dive? And I said, yes, I'd never made a night dive. We swam a half mile off the beach and made a 160 foot night dive. And uh, <laughs> you know, first Howard one. said, you know, his comment was, well, what'd you think? And I went, wow, I didn't know you could see that far at night with one of these, one of these lights. And he kind of looked at me just baffled, you know, but I, I didn't, I didn't know. 
Uh, so the point being, I latched on to the right people. Right. And, and so Howard and I started diving together a lot. And we hung out together a lot. We did kind of, we didn't, we never were roommates, but we did a lot of stuff together. And, and back in that time, we kind of started going to, to photograph big animals. It was, it was kind of the t- our ticket in. And it, it, am I showing the slides or are you guys? Uh, no, the we'll, we'll slow them here. Yes. Okay. So I think you can walk we can me through and, and tee it up, I think. And, yeah. and this is not one that was taken then, but this is just the kind of thing that kind of got my career going was taking pictures of sharks and maybe whales and dolphins and took one of the very first trips, not the first, um, down to Socorro, okay. Nato Islands. And this is, and in the Sea of Cortez, when the Sea of Cortez was as wild as Socorro is today. Um, that's a sad story, but but started doing that. And I'm not seeing the images, so I don't know what uh, it's No, we, we're just kind of going through. So right now we had the black tip, now we got the whale shark. Uh, okay, so I, it was just, you, we can kind of scroll through yeah, some of these yeah, images. Exactly. And, and w- what I would say is that, uh, you know, it was just the, it was the big animal thing. And, and I was being guided by people who are really good with animals. I mean, not dive guides, but I was in the right crowd. Right. And we went to places where now there have been resorts that have been in business, owned by locals, gone out of business, you know, been bought and sold. But in those days, there was nothing but an empty beach. And, and we explored. And diving was a bit different in that way in those days. And what it did is there was a show, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Right. And if if you're my age, I look at you, Mike, and you're nodding. I look at Luca. He's kind of a blank stare. I used to watch it. he's younger. Yeah, I used to to watch it all the time. (laughs) It it was kind of the Steve Irwin show of a few years ago. But we went with everybody's grandfathers, Marlon Perkins. Yeah. And I built, Howard and I built 16 millimeter movie cameras together and were able to land jobs. And by that time, Wild Kingdom was so out of ideas. They said kind of anything you guys can think of. And we spent, I'm not sure how many years, three or five years, maybe kind of traveling and doing three or four films a year. And, and then you'd pick up other jobs with Geographic or American Sportsman or just other television shows. And all of a sudden, I, you know, I had a platform to stand on. And uh, so I think I, there's a picture of me with hair, if that was. Uh, yeah, we yeah. got that one over. We are showing it right now. It's yeah. a little rough on me, but, uh, but that understand. was when I started. So uh, I, I proudly say that I once had to get a haircut to get into Mexico. And I don't know that, but <laughs> other than the other two other people I was traveling with, I've never heard that from anybody else. <laughs> but back in the day, Howard and Larry Cochran and I, started diving with blue and mako sharks. Okay. Yeah. should be right, you know, yep, we got off that the coast up. Yeah. of yeah. San Diego. And we didn't have any idea how to do this. We went out and I think if you look at the next slide, built a shark cage. Yeah. Put a big old window in it. Yeah. And realized that it was not a it was a two-way window. And, uh, <laughs> you got the shark so, in the cage. <laughs> it, it, you know, yeah. And that's Howard uh, and his friend inside the cage. And, but we just started going out and, and, and exploring. And of course, you know, the first times we did it, we looked at a lot of blue water for a long time and nothing happened. So then we said, okay, let's try bait. And so it kind of went that way. Well, we got some things started happening and Jaws came out about that time in in the 1970s, mid seventies, I guess. And, and, um, and so sharks took off. Well, prior to that, for a film crew to go photograph sharks or film sharks, they had to go to South Australia. Okay. Now all these people from Los Angeles could wake up in their bed. If you're producing the show, everybody could drive to San Diego, load the boat, go diving with us, be back in their bed. It saved the producers a lot of money. So we got calls from all kinds of shows to go out and, and do this stuff. And and it was a ticket in. And then I think there's the next pictures of Jack McKinney and I, I with a blue shark on his camera. Yeah. And yep. a lot of these to start with right now, these are all old film scans. So, or at least the people are, you know, the images don't look very good, but wow. Jack was one of the premier filmmakers of my early years. He was once the editor of skin diver magazine. 
I think he was the first guy to ever use a tripod underwater. Okay. And he was a phenomenal diver and cameraman. And, and I, I worked with Jack a little bit doing some shark films and Stan Waterman and Jack McKinney were extremely gracious in promoting people that were trying real hard and help them. And not every, um, not everybody does that, but, but Jack did. And I would say Jack and, and Stan Waterman and a fellow named Mike Degree, uh, who I worked with later, who's unfortunately died in a helicopter accident, were just really could not have been better than me. That's good. Um, and then at that time, uh, Jeremiah Sullivan and Ron and Val Taylor were working on the shark suit. Have you got that yeah. image yeah. up? Yeah. yeah, I remember and this so one. Actually, Jer Jer I, 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 I'm I young, but I really remember I this. I think that's uh, Valerie. Is that Valerie? One of no, the... that's actually Jeremiah. Don't okay. consult Valerie like that, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait, I remember a story from Valerie where she was the only one that could fit in the suit, so they always put her in the suit. Well, Jeremiah co-developed it. And okay. he really made a lot of the suits. Now, in those early days, I also remember him testing these suits on bulldogs or some animals in the zoo, and they annihilated the things. Right. But he learned too. But so this was all a new thing, but it was exciting. And it was, a, it was big news in the diving world. You know, if you tried to do a, a film on shark suits today, it wouldn't go anywhere. Right. You'd have to do the, the research. But in those days, it was a big deal. And Bob Cranston and I bought suits that I used it in filming. And then we started running trips and taking sport divers out off the coast of San Diego. You, in those days, you couldn't, with bait, you couldn't not get blue sharks. You wow. would get some mako sharks and it's all changed so bad. The shark populations have been so wiped out, but you can see, we would demonstrate the suit and there's a picture of Bob demonstrating the suit getting bitten. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we did a lot of that. I, I, you know, people say, have you ever been bitten by a shark? I go, yeah, thousands of times. <laughs> and, and I'm not sure I would do all that now. I don't feel comfortable with all that. It's not, but in, it's just, it was a different world. And, but it also allowed us, if you go on, I think that there's a picture of Howard yeah. working on the film and okay. we were able to get outside of a cage. And you have to think about this. We were out in open ocean, 10 to 20, 25 miles off the coast and often had 60 to 100 sharks swimming around us. Wow. Mm -hmm. And before anybody knew really, you know, what that was like. So the shark suit was a great comfort to us at, at that time. And it meant fewer safety divers. And as a photographer, you could get images you just couldn't get from sitting in a shark cage. Right. And so if you look at the, the next picture, I mean, that's just something I grabbed one day as a still photograph. Um, and I, for those that would remember, it shot with an old uh, close-up kit, either extension tubes or a close-up kit on a Nikonis film camera. Right. And again, you know, it's a it's a scan, but I would, I'm a foot away or less, right. you know, and you don't, nobody was working like that with sharks. So it was a, it was a big start. Now I look at Christina Zanato, or I guess that the, on the next shot, I've been diving with Christina and took this was she's figured out a way as a lot of people have to put those suits to much better scientific use we did have scientists and we did some things that were valuable but basically we were just trying to film sharks at, right. know, back in those days for the first time and it led to the next image which is an image of a of a friend named chip matheson that's out on the bottom of the in south australia with a great white shark gotcha I, I, this was on during a wild kingdom film here's a big difference in film we shot those on 16 millimeter film well you'd take 30 rolls of film you'd run out you had the boat for three more days or wouldn't any reason to go home so our deal was let's hurry up and run out of film then we could shoot stills and have a little fun <laughs> I mean, we wanted to make the films but these days with video nobody can run out right you know yeah so it gave us an opportunity. We just went down and we were testing, seeing what would happen on the bottom and got out of a cage with a great white shark. And that, that photograph put me on the, an international map as a young underwater photographer. And if you look at it today, I mean, I cut that animal's tail off. There's wasted space in the picture. You you probably you you know you might delete it and keep the one that where you. Oh, I wouldn't delete that one. <laughs> you know, but in that in my 
in those days in the maybe maybe late 1970s you know that was a that was a big deal for me well that, and that I, tells a story that image for sure i mean it would have been one of the first uh, i'd imagine it, it, it people outside was, of the cage. and in fact on that trip we were out we didn't know better we just went diving and we didn't have white sharks around or so we thought you know we didn't see any so <laughs> yeah there weren't any and we found leafy sea dragons and Rodney Fox said, wow, that I'd only seen one or two other ones in my life. And we found them just out, di you know, out diving and just didn't realize. I mean, it was just a whole world to open up to everybody. It wasn't, was, certainly wasn't just us. And I don't want to make it sound that way right. in, in any way. But that led to Bob Cranston and I, who had, we worked with Carl Rossler of CNC Travel. I had connections with Carl. And we started taking people out blue and mako shark diving. And that led to the first commercial trip down to Guadalupe Island that Bob and I didn't, we didn't have much success, but we started with that trip, what has turned into a cottage industry yeah. of great white sharks. And we had filmed Wild Kingdom. We'd filmed white sharks down there before um, and been outside of a cage because we were dumb and lucky and came back we just didn't know better we didn't understand that was howard and me and and who we worked on um so but before bob and i ran that trip i think that i had started i've been able to dive in the mexico sea of cortez with sea lions and everybody you know it, it, it's interesting i don't know how much cold water stuff you guys have done i hope you've had a chance to do some diving with sea lions yeah um yeah, in but, Australia. You no, know, they're just, there's nothing more fun. It's like, you know, you get the pups and it's like recess with elementary school. And and you see and sea lions come up and blow bubbles at you if you keep going through these slides right. a little mm -hmm. bit. And everybody goes, ah, it's no big deal. They're just, you know, they're bluffing you. Well, I had an experience and I had sea lion bull. Sea lion bull has lost its sense of humor. It's gained a lot of size. These guys can weigh 600 pounds, California sea lion. They're not the biggest sea lion, but they're way bigger and tougher than I am. And if you look at the next picture, yeah, that's impressive. Yes. It, which the, the, that mouth. Well, the males vie for territory. They don't care if the females made all up and down the Sea of Cortez, but not on my turf. And they will fight to define that turf. And wow. I was filming, shooting a film with the, uh, a geographic film and had two sea lions doing this thing, two bulls. And they, what happens is one of them is over here. Can you see my hands? Yes. I think you can. Yeah. Yep. One of them would bark and bark and bark. And it swims over to kind of their line. And this one backs up. And this one barks and barks and barks. And it swims back over. And it kind of goes like this. It's like being at the bar and everybody's thumping their chest on Saturday night, but nobody's fighting. And all of a sudden, a third bull showed up. I never saw it until I saw it rush at me. If you look at the next. Yeah, image. with the blue. Beautiful image. And within the blink of an eye, I was in that animal. My left arm was in that animal's mouth. Wow. Ooh. And it its head goes from my waist to my shoulder. Yeah. And the thought that went through my head was, mother is right. This is the dumbest thing you could ever do to make a living. <laughs> and the, the animal let go. And it just shook me, but it shook me, it shook me to my core, if you will. And, uh, and it made a big impression on me about not taking animals or big animals, any kind of animal for granted. I thought I was being respectful. And we hear people all the time say, I respect sharks. And I go, okay, what does that mean? I mean, you know, what does it, how do you really respect them? And I, I've learned a humbling lesson. That said, I still love to go out. And I think this next little sequence of six or eight images is I like to go on trips that target species as opposed to going someplace and just falling off a boat right. and, and, and which I enjoy doing and going and photographing anything with gills. But, but I like the challenge and the chess game of trying to photograph animals like great hammerheads or in the next one, this is a, uh, the next shot is a, blunt nose six skill shark. Okay, I, and I, so. I took this photograph at 3.58 a.m. <laughs> in about 55 feet of water in Puget Sound, Elliott Bay, Seattle. Right. And working with Howard and a buddy of mine named uh, Travis Sw uh, Swanson. And we, Howard and I drove up to Seattle 
to go, you know, try for a week or however many days, nights we did this thing, you get them at night to go do this. And I, that's, to me, I failed a lot. I mean, anybody that does this, you, you fail, but I, I just, the, this one was a reward. And it, we were cold and miserable as you often are, or completely joyous out of your mind, it, you know, and that's just kind of the way it is on these big, on the, on the targeted species right. trips. You spend a lot of time looking at nothing or searching for dolphins or whatever. But when you get them, it's an experience that you, you, you haven't had very many times and probably a lot of people haven't had. And that's always fun. So I've got a few pictures from, from your stomping grounds, which is Yap. Yes. And Yap is one of the places there are obviously suffering during this pandemic in terms of travel, but it is one of the places where you can go. That's a shark feed. That's not, I mean, there are lots of shark feeds around, but I, the Vertigo is the dive site. And I just absolutely love that site. I've done really well there with black tip uh, reef sharks and uh, gray reef sharks. Yep. And it's really fun. And you get it on good days and the opportunity to shoot reflections. I think black tips are just gorgeous, gorgeous yeah, animals. I got that little and that, swagger. That, it's that, that dorsal fin just kind of sets them apart for me somehow in the the beauty category and you'll get i think the next image you get dappled sunlight yep. a lot of times on yep. those animals up in the shallows and and it just adds such a dimension and of course there's gray reef sharks there and gray reef sharks in some place i'll say any place can be a shark shark they're not the biggest shark but they can be among the baddest yep and uh and and so you're able to work with them and that and in on a predictable basis, you get a little more comfortable and you learn over the period of a trip. I've actually done quite a few trips to Yap and thoroughly enjoyed it. But one of the things that I, I have enjoyed doing is that I think this next few pictures, I think there's a shot of a remora on the on the underside of the kind of the chin of a gray reef shark. And this was in Mill Channel, oh, okay. and which is not the shark site. Right. But it was an area we dived and I kept seeing this gray reef shark but I'd always have a wide angle lens because we were going to shoot manas. So I thought, okay, I, you know, I've, I photographed a lot of manta rays, which is comes from the luck of being in this profession. You're in the water a lot more than a lot of people. So I took a macro lens down and went down mm. mill channel and to see if I could, to, you know, make this photograph. Okay. And I love that kind of chess game more times than not i strike out, but when I get it, I feel really good. And the next, two slides kind of show the same thing. I was at, uh, at Vertigo and saw a little a jack, juvenile jack on the nose of a shark and thought, you know, I, I got a wide angle lens. It's interesting, but it's not dramatic. I went back, got a macro lens, jumped back in the water and went and got the next shot. And that's the sort of thing that to me is, is been really fun. And I guess I've kind of gotten off the subject of my career, which is okay. Well, no, that's kind of, right. Cause it just shows, you know, thinking they, this, especially the second photo, the difference between a wide angle and, um, uh, and, uh, a zoom, or not a zoom, but more of a macro lens. But so many people, when they think shark, 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 Oh, I've got to get my wide angle lens, but I always I don't know, better to have something like a, you know, a 28 to 70 or something rather than a 12 to 24. Yeah. I, I agree. I, I think that what I do is I is if I were going to photograph a shark that's a six or eight or ten foot long shark that I've never photographed before, I'd probably get in the water with a wide lens, some kind of a zoom. But but I'd be thinking a wide lens. Right. But after you get it for a little bit, I, you know, there's this temptation or this trap we fall into of shooting the same picture over and over and over. The shark comes from the same direction. You're in the cage or behind the rock. It swims. And it does its little pattern and you shoot it again. Yep. And, and you adjust your focus and exposure and you get it right. If you, I mean, after a few tries, you got to try to do something. Or it's more fun to try to do something a little different. So I think I, I don't actually know, but I would guess I had, had a, a 50 or a hundred millimeter lens right. to, to do that. And then I think like Tiger Beach is the next one where, which is misnamed as far as I can tell. I have photographed tiger sharks there, but, on that day, I could count 63 lemon sharks wow. yeah. while I was standing on the swim step. And hey. you think, oh, okay, this is a good place to dive. <laughs> Don't want to uh, jump in. You know, jump in. But it was not, it, it's not to me to get necessarily the bitiest of sharks or the, the teeth shot. But it, it's a great place where you go see all like remoras on these animals 
where you can get relatively close to them. And then in the next shot, I think about, you know, Ramora in the shark's mouth. And it, this was kind of interesting to me. I saw this guy and it went, it, the shark would repeatedly snap its mouth shut and would hear it underwater. I mean, it is, uh, it's, it, it is not gently closing its mouth. And the remora was really would quick and get out and go right back and got out. And mm. I never saw it get got, <laughs> but stomach, stomach content analyses of these sharks, they often have remoras in them. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, the, it's, I don't, it's not, it's not a free pass. Right. Slow remoras. So behavior is really the fun stuff. So if you see this next shot, I don't know if you would know the species or not. We see it in California. It's a California horn shark. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a Mexican horn shark, and they're related to the Port Jackson sharks that people in see. Australia. Your Australian guests see, yeah. And if you see its face on the next picture, yeah. it looks the face looks more like a pig's face or something than sure a bad, does. bad shark, yeah. but it's shark. And it's an egg laying shark. These guys, when they're full grown, get three and a half, four feet. I think it's an egg on the next yeah. shot. And they, they often have little hairs like strands called tendrils that help those eggs wrap up in the rock so they don't okay. get beat up in the surge and whatever. And you can hold the, those animals up. You hold the egg up to a light and you'll see an embryonic, you know, a shark developing. It's attached to a yolk sac. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to get a photograph of this shark hatching. Oh, wow. Uh, so this was, this is the, the thing that I have loved doing as part uh, of the film project. Wow. And, you know, we, this, I worked on this film with Dr. Rocky Strong. He co-produced the film with me and Rocky was a real shark wizard. And he had done a lot of work with sharks and horn sharks. And we were able to photograph them laying eggs and, and mate, mating and laying eggs and then hatching. And, it's one of these things where we just sat on the egg. He thought these eggs were about to hatch. Well, it's one thing to say it's about to hatch, keep an yeah. eye on the chicken poop, and another to say stay underwater till you're just shaking. Right. You know, you're cold and nothing's yeah. happening. And the next guy comes and the next guy comes and everybody's got the cameras loaded and ready to go. And after a number of nights, we got several hatchings. Cool. And, and it's so valuable and it, and it was one of those things where you realize that dive guides and local authorities and scientists are the unsung heroes of our businesses. They, there's so much for them to share with us if we're smart enough to listen. Yes. And I was always appreciative of that. And horn sharks or get their name from the little, the, their dorsal spines have, uh, their dorsal fins have two spines. Mm -hmm. And if you'll see the next picture is an angel shark, yep. Yep. which looks like a ray. You have angel sharks in Australia. It, it's not a very interesting photograph, but that's a potential predator of a, of a baby horn shark. Okay. And if you run the next little clip, it's a movie. Okay. Yeah. I'm running it. Yes. And we see. Oh, oh. Hey. So the, the horn shark yeah. a red is a lie. Spine. Yeah, and, and that spine is really sharp when it's little, and that's its defense mechanism. I mean, sharks get no parental care, and, you know, they're, so that, it, when these sharks are older and they're three, three and a half feet long, that those, those spines are not nearly as sharp. Okay. They don't spend the biological energy to keep them sharp, but when they're young, that, that's a big deal in their lives, and I always thought that was kind of fun. That's an amazing show. And another... Uh, Another shark that we filmed in that same film were these long nose or common saw sharks, again, from Jervis Bay in Southeast mm. Australia. And it's a not commonly seen shark because it's usually deeper than sport divers go. And I, I would say we were probably 130 feet and lucky to find two or three of them uh, on a given day, but I wouldn't bet I could go back. They are not an egg laying shark. If you, they've got those, uh, I think the next shot shows a close up of those chemosensory barbels. Yep. Mm -hmm. long whisker-like appendages, which are like the barbels you see on a nurse shark. They're chemosensory organs that just help these animals it, it detect prey and interpret their surroundings. And these are not an egg-laying shark, but the young develop inside of mom. And you can see from the next yeah. shot. So this is one of the sharks that was caught. Uh, we bought it off a of fisherman, dissected it for the, for the film, but it's just, you know, just shows the, the difference. And as we went on with that, that film project, we worked in the Sea of Cortez. 
in Mexico and worked with a group of fishermen from the state of Chiapas, Mexico, that for years have migrated up and down the Sea of Cortez following shark populations, setting nets. And, you know, these sharks, if, if we can look at the picture of the hammerhead, yep. yeah. uh, they went out. What we did is we would leave camp about five o'clock in the evening, go halfway across roughly the Sea of Cortez in pongas. And there'd be about 20 or 30 pongas and it spread out and each ponga would set a net and then we would sleep and we'd take, we'd go catch bait and then we'd sleep in the ponga until about two or three in the morning and then start diving the nets okay. and you'd see the sharks. And if you go on and then they would haul the nets at, at the next morning and Manta. you would see what they caught. They, this is a silky shark and a, and a manta ray or a, yes. and maybe a, I don't see the slide. It may, I can't remember if it's a manta or a mobula ray. Yeah. Yeah. Um, really. I, I, don't, I don't really recall, but, but the point being, those animals were used five years before that for tacos for the local population right. and maybe visitors in Mexico. Things were changing as we were making that film. And Baja, the highway had been completed. Refrigerated trucks went straight to those fishing camps every day, every morning. The boats would come in about, about just a little after sunup. There'd be another crew that processed the animals. They would be in the refrigerated trucks on their way to Mexico City, on their way to Hong Kong, and be in the markets in Hong Kong in 48 hours. Wow. Their, their markets had just completely opened up, international market, and the demand for sharks became um, unbearable for the Sea of Cortez. And if you would just keep going, you would kind of see in these slides, I think you may have another one caught in the net, somebody coming in carrying a shark yep, right at sunup. Exactly, yep. And, but if you look at the next picture, this is what happened. You'd get one silky shark female that was, you know, with pups that got caught and there was nine or 10 pups yep. and those sharks never lived in the Sea of Cortez and the Sea of Cortez got decimated. When, when we first started diving down there, there were so many places when you, if you got out away from the reef a little bit, just snorkeling in open water, you'd look down, there'd be silver tips or tiger sharks you know, coming up underneath you. Wow. And they didn't always come, they didn't come and bump you, but you know, you'd see them and that's just unthinkable now. And then there's the scalloped hammerheads of the Sea of Cortez. And they're, you know, they're, they're, they're not, they're, they're coming back to some degree, but they virtually disappeared from just fishing pressure. Wow. And it's a, it's a sad story, but one hopefully we can learn from and not repeat not continue to repeat all over the world. Mm. Like Margie, I have a question here. When, uh, what year was uh, the time that you see that uh, really the, char the shark uh, exporting started? I, I, the film was made in the late 1990s. Okay. And I would say, so by the mid nineties or something like that, this pressure to get the animals to Hong Kong had really, the world was changing. And there was more and more fishing pressure. And one of the things that happened is that, that in kind of this circle of communication, a lot of times the local dive boats, of which there weren't many in the Sea of Cortez, would get knowledge from the fishermen that they had seen hammerheads or mm -hmm. they saw manta rays. Well, then the dive boats would go out while well, other fishermen saw it. And then the fishermen learned to go fish where the dive boats were because uh. the word got out. Yeah. So we were not, you know, we're part of that issue. So you've probably heard of a site called the El Bajo Seamount in the Sea of Cortez. It was well known for manta ray population and for scalloped hammerheads. And there was times you'd go out there. It's a narrow little bitty pinnacle. Yep. And the top of it's about 55 feet, but you couldn't anchor on it. You couldn't anchor on the plateau around it. There were just there were too many fishing boats or, and there were no more sharks. Uh, and then there were no more manta rays. Right. Mm. And occasionally we see them now, but that's just, that's, that's the way the world went. Um, um, I have another question. How long did it take uh, for you to see that big difference? How long of heavy pressure fishing took? I, I don't claim to have done this with data that can be analyzed and it's very scientific, but we, 
I started diving the Sea of Cortez. I was certainly not the first, but I was among those groups. Started diving pretty hard in the Sea of Cortez in the late 70s and early 80s. And it was the magic kingdom. Right. It was big animals. It was lots of macro stuff. I mean, it was great reefs, but for a place where you could go see sea lions and manta rays and scallop hammerheads and silver tips and white tip reef sharks and, and tiger sharks and wow. the occasional bull shark. I'm not sure I really ever saw bull sharks down there, but we see them now in, at Cabo Pulmo in the Marine okay. Reserve. And uh, massive schools of jacks and schools of tuna. You, you'd be diving and this school of tuna would come through and they would hit bait balls and it would all happen so fast you'd hear them. And then it would happen so fast and they're gone. And you'd think, was that real? But you would see all these little scales, you know, drifting down in the water. And that was not an uncommon thing. And it, it's not easy to go catch a tuna. And we saw marlin and sailfish, right. um, you know, and, and uh, it was Disneyland. And the pro I've had a friend of mine, Fred Fisher, who's the vice president of underwater kinetics, uh, who's still there. And, and is, is my age and said, uh, you know, the 1970s and 80s was a golden age of diving, but we just didn't know it at the time. Hmm. And I think there is so much truth in that. The first yeah. liveaboards, the first dive computers, the first strobes, the first, you know, 36 roll exposure cameras, which now would seem like punishment, <laughs> but uh, you know, things were just different. So yeah. I, I hope that answers that question. Yeah, I guess this saying that that's what probably you were mentioning earlier about the blue sharks and the makos off California, you're not seeing them as much anymore. And I'm guessing that's, they were probably territory. They would probably swim into the bay and get it, taken out there and they're migratory. Highly, blue sharks are highly migratory. Blue sharks that got tagged off New York, get recovered in Brazil and in Spain. Right. You know, I mean, they're, and mako sharks are migratory. So I think when we were doing all that blue and mako shark diving, we didn't see the same sharks two days in a row. We, okay. we might have on some occasion, but mm -hmm. not generally. And you'd go to the same spot one day and have 60 sharks and the next day have 14. Right. Um, what we didn't have was three or zero. It just didn't happen. It does now. And it's happened a lot for wow. years. And the, the next picture is from this, uh, of um, I think white tip reef sharks. It at a place called Roca Partida, which is part of the Socorros, or yep. the AAL Islands. This little ledge had had sharks on it the first time I dived there in the early 1980s. I have dived there probably 15 times. And every time there's, except when it's <laughs> phenomenally surgy, this is down at about 55 or 60 feet. Okay. In that little cave on that ledge, there are white tip reef sharks, sharks piled in. And that little, that, that's where these animals live. <laughs> and I've always thought that was just so cool. Yeah. Um, to, be able, to be able to find something like that. The, the first dive Howard and I made out there, uh, we were, I, I can't remember, I guess we were just exploring at the time and not shooting a film. We probably saw 500 sharks when we got in the water. It was crazy. Wow. And a gray reef shark hit a, uh, what's the fish? Like a black durgan, it, just a few feet in front of us. Our backs are right up against the wall of Roca Partida and all hell broke loose <laughs> and there were sharks coming out of everywhere but the point being that there were hundreds of sharks it was you know it was it, there's a pucker factor yeah and uh and we scrambled back to the boat but even today in that remote remote area there's fishing pressure and when the boats aren't there and now with the pandemic mm -hmm. I'm sure those places are getting commercially fished yeah you know, and so I'm fearful of that. Um, mm -mm. Next couple of pictures, I think, are the last shark pictures I've got. We'll change subjects, but went uh, a few summers ago to do basking sharks off of uh, oh, Scotland. Cool. Yeah, and that was just great fun and managed to get a, a photograph of a, a basking shark feeding. They're different than whale sharks in that they don't open and close their mouth. They don't create suction. They're just passive feeders, so they open that mouth and just mm -hmm. passively swim through. Such a bizarre dense looking concentrations shark. of plankton, and it's another of those targeted species. You know, we 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 went for I think five days, and then we did some beautiful hiking. Um, 
but some of the time the wind just blew too much. Right. And you get a narrow window and it, you think, oh, this is great. This is going to be easy. And, you know, 30 minutes later, the winds come up and the sharks are either gone or you can't find them. Mm-hmm. And, but you try to find plankton, you jump in the middle of the plankton. The sharks are way better than we are at finding plankton and just keep your head on a swivel and somebody will be there before too long. So I did all that. And then one of the, one of the, uh, uh, experiences I've had that was kind of life changing for me was filming Southern right whales off Patagonia, Argentina. And that is a photograph. I think the photograph that's up on the screen now should be Howard underneath a pair of Southern right whales. Okay. Yeah. We were shooting a film for American television on CBS called Dolphins, Whales, and Us. And after the filming, Howard and Bob Cranston and I stayed down in Argentina for a week and went out to dive with Southern right whales. And the next picture, I mean, it, this again, this was back mm. in the early 80s. This is the eyeball of a Southern right whale. And uh, it, we were, we scratched these whales and we, we got out of the water. We had whale lice all over us, all over our dry suits. And this last year, maybe two years ago, a buddy of mine named Nick Dean, Nick and Cheryl are from San Diego making a film about whales. And they went down there and they were so excited to get a photograph of a Southern right whale's eyeball. And I said, yeah, well, maybe this is his mother. (laughs) Maybe the same one. Um, Yeah. And maybe from 40 years ago. So that was it. But, but the whale thing being that close to a whale and watching a whale watch you Mm. and it is life was for me, it's life changing. And, you know, we all, people always go, yeah, I was looking at him and that whale's so smart and so intelligent. And I could just tell, and I'm thinking that thing's just looking right through me. What what is this awkward thing doing in my ocean? You know, (laughs) and I wonder if it has any brains at all, but it's a, it's a magical, magical experience. Oh, sure. The ne- if we've got time still, yeah. the next uh, oh, yes. the images I have are just some behavioral things. I, li- I, I, I don't want anybody to think I'm all about and only about big animals. I love, you know, I, if you see a mud puddle, I'd like to stick my head in there and see what lives in there. So I'd like to shoot any, any animal I'd like to photograph, but I love the behavior. And this next little sequence is actually from, um, from Yap. Mike, okay. this is something yep. I've tried really, really hard to do. It's from uh, Slow and Easy, okay. which, you know, the, the yep. site. And this is a sling, a female sling jaw wrasse. And wrasses are, are sex changers, but they get, you can see from this next sequence of three slides, how they get the name sling jaw. I had tried for years to get that shot. And I found the fish in, in Yap. And you can see this really happens pretty quick. It does, yeah. But I was going to say, back you... and died with this fish, this fish, okay. for every day for ten days or oh, wow. something to try to get these shots, and was able to find the fish generally in the same location. Unfortunately, the first day he was the most, or she was the most cooperative, but I was able to get this. But that's how they use that jaw like a straw to suck in little prey. Yeah. And uh, always amazing. That's just great fun. Some of those things you go after. And the next little sequence is just kind of serendipity. This is a paddle flap scorpion, uh, scorpion fish, rhinopius. Yep. And this is from, uh, I, I work at Atlantis uh, in the Philippines. Okay. I, I'm a, one of our two photography ambassadors at Atlantis Liveaboard and Resorts. And I was diving uh, for Porta Galera and saw this paddle flap scorpion fish, went out to dive with it two or three days. And was out one day and just watched it hit a little butterfly fish, just boom. And when, and the next two slides, you yeah, just see this guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, got, he's got a mouthful. Wow. So I think some of this behavior, I think it just makes the point that for any wildlife photographer, you research and research and you try to put yourself in the right position. And sometimes it's pure dumb luck. Yep. But the only way you can have pure dumb luck is to get off the couch and go out there and be in the water. This is true. (laughs) And, and, you know, people often say, wow, you were really lucky. And there's no question. I was lucky. But the effort was I went out there when I wasn't guaranteed any luck and went out there and and made a dive. Of course, I love to do that. But that's the, you know, that's the thing. And it's, it's the same cleaning stations to me are something I cannot pass up. Yep. 
uh, underwater. It's, it's, if there's a magic situation for me, I've learned so much. And um, you had Ned and Anna Deloche on. Yes, at, we at that, did. Yep. You know, nobody's better. Nobody's better at photographing small animals than them. And one of the things they've always said is if you want to learn about fish, go watch them. Take the time to watch them. That's hard for some people to do because the clock's running. It's day five of their vacation. It's day six. They need the picture. I, I've been doing this thing professionally and I love having what I feel like is some the luxury of watching because it's a great teacher. Yeah. And if you listen to Ned and Anna, go to their presentations and dive like the dive guides. I think if I could impart any wisdom from experience, if I wanted to say, do you want to be like me? No, you want to be like Ned and Anna. Go listen to those people. They know they, they got it together and they have shared so much with the, with the diving world. Oh, for sure. But when I go to, I've seen so much behavior, not just the cleaning, but I've seen animals, I've seen, I've never been able to photograph this, but I've seen little chromies getting cleaned, turning tail to tail. One chromie's getting cleaned and another one is watching out behind it. Okay. And when the other watch fish was not there, I saw that the fish that was getting cleaned get eaten. And I've seen that a number of times. Really? And yeah, it's dropped its guard. Um, so, I, you know, I've spent hundreds of hours at cleaning stations. I've seen this a few times. Um, but that kind of stuff just blows me away. And I, and I love to see it. So I think we've got some, a couple of cleaning station shots here just from around. I think one of them is Yap Cavern, as you would know. Okay. Um, and then the next photograph and is interesting to me. And there's just this little white spotted puffer sitting on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I would just share with people that that's not what that fish usually does in the middle of the day. When you see a fish doing something that you go, huh, that's weird. Go look at it. Right. Those fish are often just kind of in this state of like a comatose state, but they're getting cleaned. And if we go through the next couple of shots, yeah. it, you know, that's what's happening is it, I didn't see the blue street cleaner ass at first, but you can almost guarantee that an animal that's vulnerable, just plop down in the middle of the, of open space. It's there for a reason. It's right. not there just because it got tired of swimming. And the thing for me is not to just get that shot of the fish around the face. The shot I love to get is, you know, is that the cleaning, the cleaner going in the mouth yep. or the little juvenile coming out of the mouth. And those are the shots that you wait and wait and wait for. So the difference perhaps in somebody that makes a living and loves to do this thing is when I see a cleaning station, I'm good. You guys go on. I'll see you at the boat, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and I understand why other people don't stay there that long. But for me, I, I, I could not be happier. And I'll, I'm going to mm -hmm. often going to go and stay. And you find that cleaning station or that area, you can go back to it day after day or for parts of dives after every dive. Yep. This next one is another little bit of pure dumb luck. Um, this is at Dumaguete in the Philippines. And we've got the little juvenile jacks on yep, top of that exactly. head of the puffer. And Watch these guys. You can see the little mustache around the puffer's face. He's feeding in that sand okay. on the muddy bottom. Um, and the jacks are all lined up to get whatever that puffer fish uncovers but doesn't get. And they will race down and get it. And I mean, sharing is not part of their MO, but I just love the opportunity to, to photograph little behaviors like that. Yeah. Same uh, at Porta Galera, the next image, I had a a situation with hairy frogfish. Wow. And this is two, there were actually three at one point, little males chasing one female. There are now two males and a female. Yeah. And I swam, these guys, I'm, I, I've always heard people, and I listened to a frogfish specialist presentation the other day, said, I always seen one swim about 30 yards. This thing swam hundred, several hundred yards. I chased these fish, hundred, several hundred, I can't prove that, but but they were going as fast as I could go backwards and not trash the bottom, going down the slope. And I think these two little males were just trying to get lucky and they were <laughs> trying to outwork the other one. And the female is kind of trying to say, okay, who's got the best genes here? Right. And off we go. And, uh, but you know, that's, that's again, being out there. But one of the stories of that is I was with some other people who watched it for a couple of minutes and then swam off, you know, and I go, what, 
what could you possibly see? Um, it's going to be more interesting, yeah. but it's not up to me to judge that. It's just, you know, it's just how I view the, view the world. So the next one, I think a lot of us have had these photographs of mating nudibranchs, but the shot I've always wanted to get, you know, okay, so nudibranchs are both uh, male and female, simultaneous hermaphrodites. So when they mate, you got boy meets girl meets boy meets girl. And the next shot I've always wanted to get, which is the very beginning of mating. And I think that here I am in San Diego or Solana Beach, California, talking to you guys in Indonesia about nudibranch penises. <laughs> That's what we're doing here. And you can see the beginning of the mating process. Yeah. And uh, that's just one of these pictures I have wanted to get. Can you see that? And yeah. that you've got up now? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, you know, uh, if, that, if that makes me a red and green, different colored ones yeah. as well. Chris, yeah. that's, that could be your Christmas card. <laughs> well, it could be, but I have to be careful who I send it to. So, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, so, you know, so it's they, that sort of thing. The first uh, Yeah, that's not in, they're just, yeah. yeah. Um, so their sexual organs are always on the right-hand side. So they mate head to tail, and that's just, uh, you know, it's what you get. So the next image is of mating again, but it's poison oscillate octopus. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Mototi photographing the female and I saw this arm come into the frame on the side and I had photographed mating mimics before and I and I knew what was happening and I was able to kind of back up and widen my frame a little bit trying to not kick up the bottom right and was able to get this it didn't last very long <laughs> um but uh but I was able to get a, little, a few shots of that so it's, a, it's interesting, you know, nowadays during the, the pandemic, we're talking about social distancing and this looks like mating from the distance, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like really oh, wow. extending out. Yeah, and in some species, they're going to lose that sp special arm there. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah, so. Use it uh, while you got it. But, but yeah, but I think that this is, this is as close as they got. I think they were able to you know, hopefully successfully reproduce. So <laughs> yes, social distancing. The next shot is less social distancing, but I think tells another little story, which is the mating mandarin fish, which all a bunch of us have been. And I, I'd be, I don't know how many, if we're, you know, how many people are listening to this, but I suspect a bunch of people who have dived in the Indo-Pacific have gone on a, on a mandarin fish dive and seen mandarin fish mate. They're dragonettes. They're in a family of fish called dragonettes. And the next shot, I was out one day again in the Philippines uh, yeah. and I saw, I was diving at sunset and I saw these two dragonets, Bartels dragonets, behaving just like mandarin fish. Gotcha. So I waited and I waited and I got a mate. Yeah. And you can see the female is ejected yeah, a little yeah. trail of eggs. Yeah, 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 you can see it. That yeah. part of it's luck. But what I had learned from all the mandarin fish dives is okay dragonets this is how this works in this family and i was able to get this that shot um nice. so that I, I i get a real kick out of that sort of recognition right. being able to turn into something most of the time you think you've got it it turns into being cold <laughs> and, and running out of air um another one these are mating uh uh sea crates oh either banded or chinese sea crates this is a in Indonesia, in the Forgotten Islands, yep, um, at Ma Manuk or Snake Island, yep. Yep. which hopefully you guys have been to, probably yep. a bunch. Hopefully a bunch. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful place, and was able to get this shot um, late one afternoon. Wow. The hard part is, I mean, they're just tying themselves in knots and knots yeah. and roll. You know, I'd say rolling around. Obviously, they're in mid water, but trying to get both their heads facing towards me, mm -mm. and you know, get the right distance and frame it and against blue water because if i framed it against the reef it was late in the afternoon they were going to get lost right but i i managed to i managed to get as lucky as they did very cool so you learn with all of these with uh uh these pipe fish um it's fairly common you see pipe fish in a lot of dives i've learned to look at every one of them and it's not uncommon to see eggs attached to the belly what is i think uh less common is that the people we dive with just aren't aware of it yeah. that these guys that the males attack glue or attach the eggs to their belly and if you i i 
love to be able to point that out and show that, share it with people, because it just peels back some layer of the ocean and opens doors where people just can have a different experience. And it's not just going out and saying, yeah, I saw a yellow fish and I saw one that was green and blue. What was that? You know, but really kind of seeing what's going on. So here's another. These are ringtail cardinal fish. That's not uncommon. Um, this with this fish, this is a fresh batch of eggs. You can tell by the red color. And it takes about yeah. five or seven days before the fish start to the eggs start to turn color. You can go to the next image. And that's the same fish. I went out there every day for a week. Oh. And those fish the next day, they were gone. Wow. Those eggs hatch. All right. But you can see how the yolk gets you used to eyes. Yeah. 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 And you can see them develop, the youngsters develop, and or the hatchlings. And, and, uh, you know, that to me is just as, again, as fun as it gets. And the next one is just a, a display. This is a Gulf signal blenny in the Sea of Cortez. Um, but it, that behavior. Uh, the, the next picture um, is spawning hamlets, yellowtail hamlets. And I, this is on a dive with Ned and Anna in Bonaire. Okay. It's around sunset. And these are simultaneous or alternating hermaphrodites where the fish is male for one spawning event and moments later, it's female. You're kidding. That same fish. Yeah. Wow. And they're going male, female, male, female for several spawning sessions. Talking the about theory. evolution, yeah? Yeah. The wow. ability. Say that again? Talking about evolution, yeah. like they can do that, you know, like. Oh, I didn't know yes, that. Yes, and we would have said our sex life is complicated. <laughs> yeah. It's, la it's laughable. Um, and it's very I, nice how the, the it looks like with the tail, it's really grabbing, you know, like to hold uh, there. I, I'd say to hold it and probably give sperm and egg just a better chance of being yeah. in the same, you know, in the same burst. Yeah. Uh, if you will. The next picture is yellow tangs. It's Hawaii. Very common fish. You see them courting, um, you know, spawning. But one of the things you learn is sex is dangerous. <laughs> fish drop their guard. If you go to the next picture, oh, that's the next bye bye. You're involved in, you know, you 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 get carried away with one activity, and and somebody's out there to take advantage of. It. Right. And you know, more times than not, somebody I guess successfully mates, or they do enough that we you know continue. But it's it's uh, it's animals are vulnerable. Um, yeah. Predators are always paying attention. They sure are. So uh, the next one again, uh, what's that? Uh, yellow barred uh, jawfish, very yellow common fish, yeah. jawfish. Here's the the shot that everybody wants to go get. Hmm. You know, see the eyes, see the eggs. I love getting the next shot, which is just the jawfish doing a little house clean. Right. Yeah, which I think we don't all. You know, we we don't get as excited about, but it's it's really fun behavior. Mm -mm. And and the next one which is um, striped or line, the striped catfish. And we see them in these balls, you know, rolling across the bottom. Well, what happens is that people, th th these are from the Philippines and the next two shots are of convict blennies. And I'm not sure I have these pictures in exact right order, but this is a convict blenny cleaning its burrow. Okay. Oh yeah, 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 yep. yeah, yeah. This yep. is and very my, rare actually. Say that again. This is very rare to see. To Would you like me to show adults. it to you again? Yeah, sure. Go to the next shot. <laughs> <laughs> so what I remembered was, this is interesting. I, I posted one of these pictures on Facebook. And Mike, you commented yeah. on something like this shot rare thing. I've seen this now in the Philippines several times. Wow. And the point is, these fish, you often see the juveniles. If you go to the next picture and then yeah. the next one, you see them around right. and people think that they are often think they're the, the catfish. So they don't pay attention to them because they're not all balled up. I don't know if you have the, the, the shot with a bunch of them in the frame. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And, and so these guys are getting ready to pile back in their hole at sunset. They live in that burrow with the adult and people will see that, but not stop to look for the adult. Mm -mm. Or not make you know not realize that that's not the striped catfish that just aren't balled up that day, and uh, you know th those images are just fun to get, and and uh, the next few uh, are just fishes displaying. That's a sand diver in the muck or in the in the kind of mud. 
And the next two, you have to be very careful how you say these. These are flasher brass. And if you say it too fast, you'll get yourself in trouble <laughs> <It's> <laughs> all right. with the audience. But these are, you know, it, it was Ned and Anna that turned me on to these guys. And th these will, they're just gorgeous fish. They'll drive you nuts oh, trying to sure do. Drive oh, you really man, nuts. Uh, drive nuts. <laughs> and, but wow, wow, how cool is Mother Nature? Beautiful. And uh, yeah, you know, you said beautiful. All I, did, I mean, I recorded it. And, and I, I, you know, I think of myself as a documentarian much more than an artist. Um, I just love to, to capture the behaviors and share the mm. behaviors and the portraits of animals in the, in the, that we dive with. Mm -hmm. And the last, I don't know, I've got four or five pictures, just uh, marine mammals. Just hate to leave them out. I think yeah. for all those sharks and little stuff, for anybody that's never dived with dolphins, go. Um, if you get the chance, you can't do it everywhere because the Marine Mammal Protection Act and so forth. But these are Atlantic spotted dolphins. It's all snorkeling and free diving in the Bahamas. But it, it, and it's one of those targeted species. You look, you can spend days and not get them. But when you get them and you get in the water with these guys, you forget all the hours and the sunburn and all that. It's just it's magic. And they have a little juvenile come up and give you the once over. Yeah. Give nice. you the eyeball. I mean, you know, how fun is that? That's amazing. Um, we also went out at night on the edge of the Gulf Stream. And it, the, the boat lights on the edge of the Gulf Stream attract bait fish and the dolphins come in to feed there. Okay. And I think I've got a couple of pictures yeah. of them at night. One of them that Beautiful. The, the, he's uh, captured a little meal uh, in, in the lights around. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah Look at that. Cool. Yeah. So, uh, that's it. And I'd say the animals that I now have just fallen head over heels in love with are humpback whales. Cannot get enough of it. I started out as a shark person. I, you know, a humpback whale, I, I would marry one. I mean, you know, I just, <laughs> I, I absolutely cannot get enough in clear water. I think one of the differences when you see humpbacks in some of the situations we're able to dive with in, in Mexico and some other whales, places I've dived with whales, in limited visibility, you see pieces of a whale. Right. When you see more than one whale or the entire whale coming from little to big and comes up to you and you have an opportunity to take a picture of them, it's, it, it's magical. Mothers and calves, which is the next one. Yeah. But we get this false, I, you know, this idea that it's all kind of the land of Bambi. And, uh, if you see humpbacks on a competition run or, uh, or a heat run yep. or in a competition group, competitive group, the males vying for rights, if you will, to a female, it is really physical. They slam into each other. I think you've probably got that picture. They bleed and Dang. it's loud Good. and it's yeah. tons of animals slamming into tons of animals close to you yeah, and it, you feel it tells you that we have this idea that mother nature you know it's all that whales are lovely and they might want to come hug me they just want to live their lives and at times that life is violent and i suppose i do have i guess i do have two more pictures or three more pictures here i guess uh that which is of course the new craze and i've got to get in my two images to be with the group and be with the ocean tribe and these are just a couple of blackwater images, one off Hawaii, which is where I started okay. uh, with Jack's Diving Locker, my first experiences uh, off Hawaii with a little uh, uh, larval slipper lobster yep. on the belly of a jelly, which is not really an uncommon shot. It was, once again, it was when I got it, uh, but less, less uncommon now. And an Atlantic long arm, long arm octopus, which I got on a dive with Ned and Anna down in, and a friend of mine named Steve Ando who hosted me down in Bon Air. Gotcha. And uh, so I think after that, the, the slide I have is, uh, is my website, because I did this, I was going to promote myself right. if I can have 30 of seconds. Can. Of course Absolutely. Whatever. Thank you. And uh, so one of the things I've wanted to do for a long time, and, and the pandemic kind of kicked me in the behind and said, okay, now's the time, is to teach underwater photography one-on-one -on -one, online through Zoom. And I've just, just started to do it. And I've got my first client. Nice. And uh, I mean, literally just started. But I am, 
I'm going to do it. And I've always loved to teach people who wanted to get better. I won't pretend to know everything um, and I won't make up answers, but it's, it's a course that can be customized. It's not a, you know, day one to day six course. Right. It starts by looking kind of at a collection of images that somebody may have shot, that somebody has shot. It kind of gives me an idea of where they are, what they might know, what they don't. And I can customize our sessions from there. And we uh, schedule on Zoom. And for anybody out there listening, um, yeah. I'd like to think I can help you. And uh, and if you'll give me a shot at it, I'd, uh, I'd love to have the opportunity. Yeah. So, I'll say thanks, thanks guys to you for that. And for, I've had a good time doing this. I, I loved it to again, share and, and, and share it with my ocean buddies. Excellent. We, I think we'll, we'll, so we'll, nice. put, we'll also put the link in the description, yeah. and everything. So, so people can, can book on with you and uh, pretty much anywhere in the world. Now they could do it with someone top notch, uh, very mm. experienced instructor. Cause you've been, you've been doing instruction for underwater photography for, for very many years as well. So, uh, really I get started an experienced instructor. with Nikon. I taught for Nikonis uh, in sites all around the world and then for CNC for years. And then I had in the late 1990s and maybe in the year 2000, a course, I was a, one of the, I, maybe the first online course in underwater photography, but it was all designed around film and Nikonis cameras. Right. Now I should have the first online course about dinosaurs. <laughs> uh, you know, so, so it's, it's pretty much a relic. But, uh, but I did it and I just never, I knew I should always make a digital program like that. And I just kind of didn't do it, but the world has changed now and you can yep. have such access like this to really communicating with people, uh, you know, about, uh, about on an, on a one-on-one -on -one right. scale. Really so, personalize the, the, the yeah. lessons to them. Well, actually, well, thank you very much, Barry. That mm. was, uh, extremely entertaining and a really good look into, uh, your career and, and what you're doing now. Are you also, um, are you still leading trips as well to different areas of the world? You know, mostly I, what I have done is with Atlantis to the Philippines. Okay. I was supposed to do a, a trip to Indonesia this year, but I got pandemic and uh, as so many of us did uh, have, and I don't know exactly what the future holds in okay. that regard. I, I enjoy doing them. I'm not really set up for the infrastructure and the booking and the follow-up questions, which people deserve to have answered. Right. And I wouldn't go on a trip if I couldn't get those answers, but I would rather do it with an entity that, that. Has All right. And, uh, I think, uh, we got a little bit of a glitch in there. Can you Mike, uh -oh. uh, check that out? What happened there? This stopped ahead of time. Hey guys, are you still there? Can you hear me? Yes. We having a little bit technical problem. This is happening when we do the morning ones. If you are there, please say hi. I'll be back in focus on a camera soon. There you are. Am I focus, Mike? Cool. Apologies for the little inconvenience, guys. And uh, basically, that was pretty much uh, uh, the end of the interview with uh, Marty Snyderman, which was uh, an incredible uh, hour. It was a true masterclass yes. uh, of a presentation, Very wasn't so. it? Very entertaining as well. Not just not just a masterclass, but entertaining. Yes, very entertaining. And actually, beside the skills, of course, the, the experience and being one of the legend and pioneer out there, the passion that the man has got is really, yeah. really incredible. Especially, I mean, you, you spend 50 years in the ocean and still have this much passion towards it. I mean, you look at what he's talking about with, with the cleaning station. You go in, okay, we found a cleaning station. Most people would spend five, 10 minutes at it. He's got the passion as well. Okay, I'm going to stay mm -mm. in the, the rest of my hour down here and just watch because that's the thing. That's the that's what that what makes the difference yeah. between getting a snapshot and getting something that can really show the behavior. Show mm -hmm. um, doesn't matter if you're shooting video or photo. 
spending that time and watching and learning from what these yeah. these creatures are doing that's mm -hmm. the way to do it and, yes. and marty's really got the passion to do so uh -uh. and actually many times uh, also speaking with uh, uh ned and anna ned was saying that you know many times the dive guide because he's so often there in the water actually witness such a interesting behavior and just by being there you can really develop uh, uh, this uh, knowledge you know that sometimes yep. so goes even over uh, the science but most of time goes over the scient scientists exactly. uh, um, they don't know the scientists are, are sitting in their in their uh, labs and they, they're not yeah. necessarily out there in the field correct so thanks uh, once again uh, marty for this uh, presentation and the time given to us uh, here i we really appreciate that and we're really looking forward actually to have you coming over here and uh, dive also with us uh, yeah. in uh, in Indonesia once all to, this is over and, this and not only you and all the people that are here in this uh, uh, in our community here on the page uh, on Facebook in the chat room and also the shy ones that are not commenting there. Oh, hi, Carol. Yes, we all look. We all really look forward to see you exactly. here. I noticed there are a few things happening that there are a little bit more glitches when we do this presentation early in the morning than you see, in the when I roll out of bed and come straight to the office. Yeah, uh, and actually, we were matching uh, the interview with Marty there. Like our face looked a little bit sleepy also during that because we did it quite early in the morning. <laughs> we did that too. one early in the morning. Yeah, as well. with Marty, we so did. it's good to match those up. Okay, guys, I hope that you enjoyed uh, today's show, and uh, that's it for this week. It is. Before we go. What we let's give next, a reminder who we're gonna have for next week. Next week. Let's see. So we're gonna have on Monday exactly Helen Sampson. Helen Sampson on Monday. Yes. Kay Burn Lim on Wednesday. Wednesday. And then Brian Green and Richard Pyle on Friday. On Friday. So another interesting week coming up. And lots uh, of good stuff. A great weekend for all of us. Yes. That we're gonna spend. Don't forget to click on Marty's links down in the comment or ah, down yes. in the in the uh, in the in the notes in below, the description you will see that marty's got his uh his digital underwater photo class that you can find on there so you can take time to learn from the master from himself. the best one-on-one -on -one photo classes with marty are done online done on zoom so it doesn't matter where in the world Such you are you can do that really good opportunity yeah. to learn from someone yeah. like marty and it's interesting also how he was saying that basically you submit like a uh a group of uh, pictures to him like yep. this and then he can uh, help you giving you a few notes to to improve those so exactly. it's, a, it's a great way to do that good. yeah so last but not least last if you would like uh, to support uh, the underwater tribe here we bring you weekly content and show for you and uh, if you would like to support our center here in uh, in bali during these difficult times so we put few links in the description and uh, you can just use those links uh, to uh, give a small uh, donation to us uh, over here all right guys uh, i think uh, now it's time to say goodbye yep have a great weekend everyone have a great weekend everyone goodbye bye bye